Thank you so much. I am delighted to have been invited to discuss my work in Black business history. And it's like, where do I begin? Um, it's so interesting that one of the major activities in which Black people, people of African descent have been involved from the very beginning in this country is business. And yet, with few exceptions, historical uh, interpretations have not gone into great detail with information on Black entrepreneurship. Uh, what is so interesting as well is that Black business activities literally began when the first Africans were landed in Virginia in 1619. And the reason for that is that African societies had very complex economies included in the various business activities were trading organizations, women involved in management and sales and merchandising. Um, and the culture is indicative of this business and entrepreneurship that existed in Africa. And what is so strange and, well, it's not strange. What's interesting about it is that when people talk about the transatlantic slave trade, uh, uh, when people have written about it, uh, it's, it's literally like Africans are running around in the jungles half naked and the Europeans are running after them, grabbing them and taking them back to the shore and, 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 and putting them on the ships and sailing away. But the transatlantic slave trade not only profited the Europeans, it also profited the Africans because with the trade, um, Africans began to generate increased wealth because the Europeans didn't just go in and grab some Africans, like I said, and throw them on their ship. No, they had to pay to even dock their ships. They, some of them built uh, prisons or uh, castles uh, uh, to store the, uh, the Africans while they waited to get a full shipload. And then they would go sailing off to, to America. But let me give you an example of pre-colonial Gold Coast town occupations of Africans in the 17th century. Now these are occupations in, in the African, West African culture uh, before Africans got to the new world. Um, among those are and I don't know if you can see them. Yes, you can. Uh, Pre-colonial Gold Coast town occupation of Africans, the 17th century. Okay, these, oh, thank you, thank you. That's it, okay. Uh, here are the occupations, day laborers, okay, yes, but carpenters, blacksmiths, bricklayers, stone cutters, potters, half and cap cap makers, wood cutters, canoemen, masons, bricklayers. Now here again, these are occupations in West and West Central Africa during the transatlantic slave trade era. Okay, goldsmiths, coopers, hammock carriers, mat makers, Thatchers, fishermen, ferrymen, also 
there were pallets, charcoal burners, common soldiers, market sellers, water carriers, low-ranking priests, astrologers, woodcutters, lime makers, hawkers, bead makers, water seller, priestess, diviners, professional grave diggers. Uh, and these were just some of the occupations in West and West Central Africa before the trans, before and during the transatlantic slave trade. Now, another indication of the extent to which wealth was very important to Africans could be seen in Ashante aphorism on, okay, on trade, wealth, and poverty. Uh, one, and this is what the Ashantis, you know, part of their culture, money does not go out to earn its livelihood and come back empty handed. Okay, that's an aphorism, which very much reflected and illustrated the extent to which increasing and generating wealth was important. Okay, two, wealth is beyond everything. Nothing is beyond that again. Next, gold dust is like unto a slave. If you do not look after it well, it runs away. Now this one, mm, uh, well, we have to give, bring out all the facts. Uh, and number four says where the gold dust is, that is where the women like to be, okay? Number five, okay? When the women say to you, you are a handsome fellow. That means you're going to run into debt. Okay, continuing, poverty is stupidity. Poverty is madness. And if the poor man has nothing else, he at least has a tongue with which to defer the payment of his debts. And then another one, which I think is tremendously significant as far as a reflection of the culture. And that says, if anyone invokes a fetish against you, saying, let this man die, he is not harming you as much as he would were he to say, let poverty lay hold on him. So consequently, and, and, and I emphasize uh, this, information because when Africans got to the, the new world, to what would become the 13 colonies, uh, they quickly got involved in the economy. And, uh, and, and what is so significant is that the degree of involvement in which you would find Africans, uh, they were not just uh, planting cotton in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, they were not just agricultural workers. It was like in, 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 in urban places and cities today, as these cities began to develop and grow and expand, Africans were involved in the business activities. And this is an example uh, which is really not emphasized. All we tend to be taught or have been taught is that Africans were picking cotton and planting sugarcane, and that was it. Okay, but let's look at the reality. Here we have black property ownership and development. Now these are economic activities and business activities of Africans in the 18th century, the late 17th and then the 18th century, all up you know, to the Revolutionary War era and after. Okay, what are they? Africans own property in 
Rural areas, they use the property for farming. In urban areas, they use that property for real estate speculation and business use. Uh, Africans had town that they set moving in together, black settlements uh, and chattel, slave property ownership. Yes, Africans owned or black Americans, Africans that became Americans owned slaves. Um, now the kinds of enterprises they had, if you look carefully, in construction here again, brick layers, brick masters, brick molders, carpenters, okay, metalworking, blacksmiths, coppersmith, goldsmith, gunsmith, silversmith. Then the clothing industry, you had cobblers, dressmakers, shoemakers, tailors, tanners. And then in transportation enterprises, carriage and dray makers, ship carpenters, shipwrights, wheelwrights, woodworking, carpenters, furniture makers, utensils. And then there were urban personal service enterprises. Okay, and they're all listed, arts, entertainment enterprises, music schools, portrait painters, sculptures, food service enterprises, caterers, restaurateurs, bakers, butchers, street vendors. I mean, this is what Africans were doing in 18th, 17th and 18th century colonial America. Now, why is this important? Because as we dazzle ourselves through four centuries, the question is, how could this be possible that Africans were involved in American business activities for 400 years and yet business participation rates and profits generated today as we move into the 21st century after four centuries, those percentage of profits and percentage of black involvement in the economy differs little from those percentages back in the beginning in the 17th and 18th century. So four centuries and yet black Americans are still at the bottom. And one excuse that has been given not one, but the major excuse is that Blacks lack a historic tradition of business enterprise. Unlike the other people who have come to America, they had a strong tradition of business, but not Black Americans. So therefore, that's why they had nothing. They had nothing, they were nothing, and they know nothing. So we move into the 20th to the 19th century. Okay, yes, the Revolutionary War took place. Blacks participated in, in the Revolutionary War. Uh, many of them made money during the Revolutionary War. And some Blacks left with the British, uh, went to Europe and France, and then went to Africa, West Africa after having lived uh, in, in England. And uh, one of the countries which would be established by those Africans was Liberia. But anyway, there were also free Blacks. That's how many, that's how the profits were used by free Black, by first slave business people. Uh, they saved the profits from their enterprises and, and they ended up buying, buying, buying their, their freedom. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, maybe I'll say it now. Uh, here, here, here is the book, Free Frank, on my great-great-grandfather, who was born a slave in 1777. 
aunt, his mother was African born, his father was a slaveholder. And one could say that my interest in reconstructing black business history came about by hearing about my great great grandfather, Free Frank. Of course, he wasn't called free until after he had purchased his freedom. And what is interesting, I won't go into all the details, is the product that he produced uh, that enabled him to purchase his freedom was uh, uh, an item that one would not expect slaves or free blacks to have access to. Access to. Okay, Free Frank was born in South Carolina. The owner took him to Kentucky. And uh, in 1796, Free Frank was born in 1777. Owner took him to Kentucky in 1796 and bought new land. Uh, and then Free Frank, uh, as he got older, uh, uh, well, he, he got a wife and he started having children, still a slave. And so his owner did something that uh, some owners did because they profited from it. They allowed the slave to hire his or her own time. Now, most of the slaves who hired his or her own time uh, primarily lived in cities and, and in towns as well. But what these slaves would do would work for the owner, do the owner's work all morning, all day. And the owner told them, Yes, you can hire yourself out. Uh, some owners required slaves to pay them to allow, uh, to, to whereby when they allow them to hire their own time. But what's interesting is the product that Free Frank got involved in as he began to generate profits from his hiring his own time out. Free Frank began, lived in Kentucky in an area where saltpeter was produced. Saltpeter, the principal ingredient uh, made from crude niter used in the production of gunpowder. Now, this seems ironic uh, that whites would allow slaves to be involved in making a product uh, that became gunpowder. But that's what Free Frank did. And eventually he purchased first his wife and then himself. And uh, then he set up a branch of his manufacturer, of his business. And uh, he, he continued to work for the slave owner uh, and, uh, and got paid. So I'm, I'm going to go back, leave Free Frank in Kentucky while I provide examples of, of, of other kinds of black entrepreneurs. So Free Frank was, you know, in, 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 in a frontier area in Kentucky. But uh, at that time, Native Americans, uh, Indians were being killed as whites moved across their land. And so, uh, but at the same time, uh, the uh, Whites needed guns and weapons, and to have bullets was very important to them. But to continue with uh, antebellum Black entrepreneurs, um, here is uh, a cabinet maker and undertaker. Uh, antebellum Black entrepreneurs, uh, William Goodrich. Uh, okay, he has a barber shop. Now, let me say something which is really interesting. Just like today, where we have credit reporting agencies, back in the late 18th and throughout the 19th century, uh, there were credit reporting agencies in the United States. 
and these credit reporting agencies provided information on the kinds of businesses and the amount of money, the amount of money that black business people were making. Now here, you know how those credit reporting agencies are. And yet this information is available in the R.G. Dunn & Company credit reports, uh, those books are at the Harvard Baker Business Library. And they've been there all these, this time where people have been out collecting all kinds of documentation for slaves picking cotton. Here was information on slaves making money. Now, uh, with William Goodrich, what does it say about him? He has a barber shop, but okay, okay, yes, blacks were doing hair barber shops back in the 17th and 18th century. But listen to this: October 1845 has a barber shop. But what's significant? Cars on the railroad. This man had ran cars on the railroad. That is, he had cars. And he, he, he carried or uh, provided transportation of items used in wholesale and retail trade. So he ran cars on the railroad. He deals in jewels. He had an oyster company, a printer. Now, next, in 1848, June, a colored man worth 20 million dollars, 20, excuse me, $20,000. And it describes him close, close, shrewd, attentive, and safe for contracts. Uh, 1852 has a great many irons in the fire, but seems to be making money. Runs a train of cars on the Columbia Railroad. You know, these were this black man's railroad cars that he ran on the train tracks. Uh, and this is documented in the credit reports. Now, okay, look at the next people. Bernard and Albin Soleil, Louisiana. What were their occupations? Exchange brokers and merchants. 1853, they were worth $100,000 described as free men of color, are very wealthy. Uh, by 55, July 9, 1855, they had between 250,000 to 300,000. This was during the age of slavery. And, and, and the R.G. Dunn & Company credit reports described them as capitalists. Okay. Uh, now there's some others, uh, slave on the other side. Uh, these are slave enterprises. So that's how many slaves got free. They told their earner they wanted to hire their own time because for a slave to work at developing a business, the slave had to do the work for the owner and then he had to pay the slave owner to allow him, as they said, to hire his own time. So it was a hustle, a hustle. Okay, now that you can see the slave Millie, what had she been doing? She had been a bakery uh, and also manufacturing and selling bed, bed clothing. Okay, uh, Alec was a likely mulatto slave, 25 or 30 years old, skilled in the business of attending, managing a drugstore. He had been hired in 1847 to two druggists in Columbia. Okay. Uh, now to continue, antebellum free black women enterprises. Okay, so the thing is that just as African-American women are out there literally in participating in so many different kinds of jobs. 
always busy. This was the case during the age of slavery. Black slave women also uh, asked the owner to allow them to hire their own time. Now, uh, here was an organization, the Female Trading Association. And uh, they continued their establishment consisting of dry groceries and so forth. Okay, so the Female Trade Association was here getting involved in, in food, uh, cooking and distribution, but also look over at self-employment occupations of women in Philadelphia in 1838. Look at these jobs. These were enterprises, biscuit makers, boarding houses, uh, cake bakers, cooks, dressmakers, eating houses, restaurants, hairdressers and barbers, hair workers, upstreet, midwives, music teachers, quilters, seamstresses, okay, tailoresses. These were Black women businesses. Here again, the point is, just like today, uh, if you pull up the internet, you look at Black newspapers, Black magazines, but getting back to the internet, uh, every day there's a new business being started by a Black woman. And even today, there are businesses started by six-year-old kids. This is a culture that we've had. And, and, and yet it's as though black people have never worked a day in our lives. Now, this one is very important. It's the leading black entrepreneurs. Okay, because the leading black entrepreneurs, they start off with the wealthiest. And this is, uh, incredible, but this information is out there. Wealth holding of representative leading black entrepreneurs, 1820 to 1865. Minimum property values of $100,000. Okay, at the top is William Leader's door. Uh, San Francisco was his location merchandising, real estate. Uh, when he died, his wealth would be um, amounted to 1.500,000, 000, $1,500,000. Now, Lena's door was born in the, one of the islands and his mother was a slave, his father was a slaveholder. And he came to the United States and then he went to California with the gold rush. Uh, even before the gold rush, he went to California. And uh, when he, it was only after he died that people discovered he was black. Uh, Lenersdorf was San Francisco's first city treasurer. Uh, and he's someone you need to read about. Uh, anyway, uh, $1.5 million. When gold was discovered on his land, several days later, he was killed. Someone went to the island where he was born and gave his mother uh, $50,000. And, uh, and then when the estate was settled, what that person paid got paid $50,000 for Lita store uh, estate was worth 1.5 million. Look at Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith was also a very wealthy entrepreneur. Uh, in the RG Dunn & Company credit reports, they called him worth $500,000, quote, king of the darkies. King of the darkies worth $500,000. So 
these are all wealthy, wealthy black entrepreneurs. You see that most of them were in Louisiana. Um, and there is one woman on here. McCarty, McCarty, Madam C.C. McCarty. How much did she have? $155,000. No, she was, she was not the Oprah of her time. No. Okay. Now, the thing is, I could go on and on, and I'm not going to go on and on. I'm, a, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I want to get into the 20, I want to get to the 21st century. But the point I want to make, oh, getting back to Stephen Smith, he also ran cars on the railroad, and he was involved in the lumber and coal industry. And so the, here again, the point is, we got 400 years of Blacks involved in business, beginning during the age of slavery and then continuing um, up until the 21st century. And when you get to the end of, of any analysis and comparative assessments, what you will find is that Black business conditions, Black business revenues today differ very little from, from, from Black business activities, participation rates and revenues that existed during the age of slavery and then in the post-Civil War era uh, we could go on and on. But if you look at this, you will see lumber merchant, merchant broker, capitalist, tailor, real estate, sugar planters, sugar planters. Then another one, capitalists. Okay. Sugar planters, tailors, cotton planters, sugar, cotton planters, commission broker, undertaker. The undertaking business goes back to literally uh, 1620s. It was a very important aspect of Black business activities. Uh, so, the Civil War. Oh, I should jump, go back a few decades that by the time we get into the 19th century, the 18th, 20s, 30s, you got Blacks uh, who are involved in international trade, uh, especially conditions in Europe, uh, in, in, in Liberia, in Africa. So um, OK, so before the Civil War, uh, America was growing, expanding, exploring and becoming powerful, especially with the Civil War encouraging the manufacturing of weapons. And at the same time, back in the 1830s, we had the steamships or the sailing ships. They would eventually become steamships. Uh, used in trade and transportation. Uh, so there was an encouragement uh, among Blacks to uh, not encouragement, their encouragement. Uh, the whites would not encourage them to be inventors. And if you look here, Elijah McCoy, he patented the first automatic lubricator followed by over 50 patterns for lubricators, including, and then it has them listed. Okay, then Louis Latimer, uh, the railroad car water closet, you know what that is, uh, the electric lamp. And uh, then we get to Granville T. Woods, telephone transmitter. So just go down the the list of those inventors. And it, it, here again, African, Africans in America 
African Americans have been involved in the development of this country from the beginning, generation after generation after generation. Okay, I, we have um, uh, 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 a, a couple other inventors. Inventors, uh, do we have the uh, helicopter inventor? Okay, here we are, the black car manufacturer. Okay, uh, the Ford Motor Company started putting out the Fords about 1908. This individual, Patterson, uh, also was an automotive manufacturer. And in fact, while Ford's cars sold for 400, Patterson could get eight, 800 for his cars. Plus his car was faster than the Ford uh, car. But Ford had something that Patterson did not. Ford had the assembly line. So that is why, even though his car wasn't as fast uh, as, as the Patterson Greenville, uh, it was less money. Okay, let's see. Uh, now I have jumped, but let, let, me, let me stop. Okay, what have we, where have we been? Okay, we were in colonial America. Uh, 1607 with the founding of Jamestown to 1776 with the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so, and then we had the Revolutionary War. Uh, the war ended, of course, America won the war. We would have a, a, a constitution. And as we moved into the 19th century, we had another war the War of 1812. And here again, you can bring Blacks in involved in not only manufacturing products, uh, which Free Frank did uh, with the gunpowder. Okay, then it was at the end of, 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 of the War of 1812, it ended in, in 1815, that we began to see an expansion in urban places uh, in the cities, the towns, and the numbers of people living there. Um, this continued uh, until the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, there were blocks, 12 blocks in Congress during Reconstruction. Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. And then post-Reconstruction, blocks moving westward over a hundred towns were founded in, in, in the frontier area uh, west of the Mississippi River. But what is significant is when we get to 1900, in my book, uh, The History of Black Business in America, oh, I wish I had a copy to show you, uh, but I, I don't. Uh, There's a chapter entitled, The Golden Age of Black Business. Um, and let me see, maybe I can find that chapter, chapter. Yeah, The Golden Age of Black Business, 1900 to 1930. And this is when Blacks get involved Whatever was going on in America, Blacks were out there doing it. And so we had the development of the motion picture industry, and there were Blacks, 1960, the Lincoln Motion Picture Company. And then records, okay, music. Okay, Black Swan record label. And then also during that time period, there would be other new uh, expressions of, of, of Black music. And um, we haven't gotten to hip hop yet. No, we're still back in the 20s. Uh, so, um, and Black, okay, record companies. Uh, the Roaring 20s, 
proved profitable. Now, two black women, Barry and Ross, Miss Barry and Miss Ross, they began to manufacture dolls and uh, in New York. And also they got into the children's clothing industry and they did quite well. Uh, they expanded to North Carolina and other places. So what do we have? Now, I want to get to this uh, industry. Uh, as I indicated earlier, free Blacks and slave Blacks who would become free participated in, in developing drawing patents. And this individual, John Mathwerter, that was Free Frank's grandson, which made him my great great grandfather, John Mathwerter. Uh, he had two patents for helicopters. These are helicopters, 1911, 1922. And I didn't mention that. My great great grandfather, Free Frank, had founded a town in Illinois in Pike County. Pike County is on the Mississippi River. And the town he he founded, you know, went and and, and, and had 144 town lots uh, that was founded in 1836. And uh, eventually he uh, there would be efforts made to try to take the town away from him in the 1850s. But he was succeeded in preventing people from do that, doing so. Okay. Um, now, here is a Black woman. I can't see her name. Well, I mean, I know her name. Uh, Alice H. Parker, Patent Gas Heating Furnace. This is her patent. So that's one thing. Blacks had patents and have been involved in the, you know, the various industries and enterprises uh, from literally the very beginning. Well, when the patent industry started. Uh, okay. Uh, what? Okay. Okay. In the twentieth century. There were three waves, three phases in the rise of Black corporate America. Okay, you have the golden age, 1900 to the 1930s. And then you know what happened, the Great Depression, World War II. But World War II, 1941, you see that there were Blacks involved in business. Uh, and those businesses, uh, well, they did pretty well. And these individuals became millionaires. That was the second wave rise of Black Corp America. And then from the 19, 1940s to, wait a minute, the 1960s, okay? Because by the time you get to the 60s, that's the civil rights era. And that's when you would have black businesses expanding uh, and, 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 and knocking down the doors of segregation. Uh, blacks got out there. And interestingly, uh, two areas of enterprise in which there was great success was in the music industry and the sports industry. So uh, I, I don't know uh, if I've gone beyond, are there questions? We do have a, a few questions. Of course, I there's so much great information. I hate to, to stop you, Dr. Walker, but I do wanna um, ask a couple that we have submitted. Um, so one question that we had come in um, was asking if there's any evidence that certain trade skills were sought after by slave traders. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh my God, yes, yes. And they ask about them because slaves could demonstrate they could do that job. 
And so they did, yes, most definitely. And that was one of the reasons because of their skill that slaves were able to negotiate with their owners uh, for them to hire their own time. That is, if they hired their own time, they made money and they could pay the slave owner. So the slave owner generated, uh, generated revenue from the slave in two ways. One, selling the product that the slave made, and then with uh, the slave paying the owner money for, to allow him to hire his own time. That would be, you know, hiring your own time. I know everyone knows uh, what that is, but it's like you are paying someone to let you work. <laughs> and that's what uh, many slaves did who got free. There's also, so on um, a slide a little while back, the antebellum free black women enterprise slide, there's a category on there that says, um, do their own work on the table about their occupations. Um, do you know what would, went into that? Uh, it depended on the, doing their own work. It would mean that if, if say they were, uh, um, a, a, I'm looking up a cake baker, Okay, and so, though, oh, that's a self-employment occupation. But it first started off with the person, the slave, primarily a slave woman, uh, helping the her owner uh, with the baking, and then uh, asking the owner uh, if they could hire their own time. So that's doing their own work, and that's what. Uh, self-hired slave slavery was all about uh, is that slaves hired their own time. And uh, so, and when you would do that, that would be doing their own work. And we have a, a few more questions. So um, we have a comment also very interesting. Um, and historically, this person wonders how many black entrepreneurs were ignored by RG Dunn and company and mass media. Are we undercounting black entrepreneurs before the third wave by relying on these sources? Okay, okay. Uh, the credit reporting agency wasn't going to ignore any person making money because if they did, they could cut someone's, uh, cut profits from someone. Or if they ignored an individual who was making money and, uh, uh, Okay, if they did that, ignore the person who was making money, uh, that this person was a crook uh, and, and, and you had borrowed money, say you had borrowed money from this individual. And uh, I, I mean, it's, you would have cost someone uh, loss of profits if you did that. For example, like they described this Stephen Smith, who was worth $500,000 as king of the darkies. Now suppose Stephen Smith didn't have $500, but they had him being worth 500,000 and running cars on the railroad and he didn't do that. So the person who paid Stephen Smith to do something, to run, you know, his, his product on the train, you know, to to travel to another city to sell that product, uh, he would lose money. So R.G. Dunn and company, no, they, they uh, were very careful in the information that they put down on uh, someone's credit. They were just not writing down information. And so it could be possible that Blacks enlisted had more money than what was there. <laughs> I don't know. Um, are there any black owned companies from the 1900s that are still around today? Wow, that is a good question. In the 1900s, do you mean the 20th century <laughs> or the 19th century? I have written here the 1900s. So if the person wants to clarify, you can, you can go ahead. And okay, when you say that. the 1900s, I see from 1901 to 1999.
And we're waiting for the person to clarify. So okay, wait um, a minute. The 19th century is 1800 to 1899, as you know. So while we wait for that, I, I can jump to the next question um, just until we get some clarity on that one. So with this history context that you're sharing, um, what's your perspective on reparations? Why not? Why not? Everybody can use some extra money. Um, and what do you envision as the next major wave of Black entrepreneurship? Oh, here again, that's a, a, a good question. Okay, what's out there? Where are we going? Uh, what, what I'm seeing with, with the whole business movement uh, of entrepreneurs is that a very narrow number, small number of people, whites, control literally almost, I won't say 90% of the wealth but at least 30% uh, it's, it's, oh, let, let me add something to this. Uh, people say that blacks have been failures in black business, in business. That blacks have been failures in business. Uh, and that when we look at the business history of Blacks, what we see is that Blacks have participated literally in every area of business that whites have had in the United States. And what we're beginning to see today is a few doors are opening more than what they were before. But the simple truth is that during the age of slavery, during the age of Jim Crow, uh, during the age of where we are today, that black business receipts over time, over those four centuries, have literally amounted to only 3% of total American business receipts. That is, when you look at the businesses in America, 2.6 million businesses, uh, and those businesses generate in terms of income, 3% uh, of total American business receipts. So we can look at our six black billionaires, you know, two of them are our athletes, two of them are uh, entertainers, um, and the other two uh, are in business. In fact, the wealthiest African-American entrepreneur is here in Austin, Texas. Uh, he's in the investment uh, industry. Uh, he has about $4.5 billion. But yet, so uh, that, that's a way in which we can, you know, begin to look at uh, Black business. And so that's why it's so important to get four centuries of information to show that we have done, that we have been participating in business, but no matter what our participation rates today remain literally the same as they did with the beginning of Black business activity in the United States. Thanks so much, Dr. <laughs> Walker. We're unfortunately at time, um, but we really appreciate it. I know, especially rescheduling with the snow that Texas had experienced. Um, so we really appreciate your time, really important information. 
Um, and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, as you know, this is part of a larger series of history and legacy of black entrepreneurship in the United States. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and drop that link in the chat to everyone if you wanted to go um, on the website, get a little bit more information of more upcoming events. Um, and we will actually have Dr. Walker back on April 22nd for our closing um, roundtable event. So we hope everyone joins us then. Um, when you close out today, there's also going to be a brief survey that will pop up. So definitely appreciate any feedback you have. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Walker. You're quite welcome. And I look forward to April. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone. Learn more about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States by visiting kellercenter.princeton.edu slash Black entrepreneurship. Join us for future Keller Center events, which you can find at kellercenter.princeton.edu slash events.